So, anyway, um, just to recap what we did yesterday, if you remember, um, I introduced uh, the concept of parameterization. After we discussed uh, earlier, we went through some of the basics of the resolution of models, uh, the time step, and the, uh, some of the basics of what we have to consider with the stability of models. And then uh, we went through with the, um, basically, the, the barotropic vorticity equation as an example. We actually did the, the process of Reynolds averaging. So there are a couple of people that uh, didn't manage to get here yesterday, so just for your benefit, we went through the barotropic uh, vorticity equation. And then by using the process of Reynolds averaging, if you remember, where we divided a continuous function up into its grid box average in a climate model and its local perturbation. Okay, we found that quite conveniently, after we applied the Reynolds averaging to the expansion of the barotropic vorticity equation, we ended up uh, with a, a form of the vorticity equation that looked identical to the original continuous function, but it was written in grid box average terms. Okay. And we had just one new term, which was due to the uh, correlation uh, on the subgrid scale between velocity uh, perturbations and the parameter in question. And that was this term here. Okay. And so then we discussed the fact that this meant that in order to be able to close this equation, or the set of the five equations that I introduced to you, which were the fundamental equations that uh, are basically used in climate systems or models or weather forecast models, that we needed to be able to write this term as a function of the grid box average variables. Okay, so we needed to find a function h where we could write the, 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 the flux term in terms of the resolved variables. And then I gave one example yesterday, which was a very simple one, where we discussed subgrid scale turbulence as actually representing a down gradient mixing. So we had the, the example of like releasing a gas in the corner of the room and then mixing essentially leads to a homogeneous situation where the gas is well mixed within the room. And so we actually went through this example and we parameterized the uh, flux itself in terms of a constant multiplied by the gradient, uh, which meant that we could then parameterize our convergence of the flux in this way. Okay. And so then substituting that back into the barotropic vorticity equation, we then had a version of the equation which was identical to the continuous equation, except that the three terms that we had before are now written in grid box average uh, quantities. And we have a fourth term which represents the net effect of everything that's going on on the subgrid scale. So that was our parameterization. Okay. And we talked about ways we could improve that by making k, for example, a function of the atmospheric stability. Okay. So you came up with that idea which was, in fact, the way that the progression of these schemes went in the 1970s and the 1980s, after the initial schemes, which actually looked exactly like this. This constant K down gradient diffusion was used in the first global model integrations in 1963 by Smagorinsky. Okay, the first integrations on a global scale on a computer uh, um, with the full... Uh, five equations. As I said, this, this barotropic vorticity equation was used for the first forecast models, but it's just a two-dimensional, uh, very simplified equation. But the first full integration of the, the, you know, the, the five set of equations that I personally know of, um, I think it was Smag Smagorinsky in 1963, and it used exactly this parameterization. So it's not just an idealized theoretical example. It was used uh, in the early examples of integration in numerical models. But then it was superseded by improving the representation of K in the ways that you, for example, suggested yesterday in class. Okay. So I wanted to give one more example today uh, connected to the, the subject that I'm, I'm personally very fond of, which is cloud parameterization. And then I have some slides which are a little bit more relaxed, as it's the last lecture, which is uh, concerning should we say, uncertainty in weather forecast and climate models. So we'll see how we get on for the timing, but they're a little bit more relaxed, and they're not converted into this format yet. They're in a PowerPoint presentation, so you haven't had those, but that's a little bit more relaxed material. Okay. So 
we discussed in Monday's lecture some basic physics of cloud physics. So we, we discussed the activation of droplets, and we discussed how those droplets can bump into each other and form rain droplets. Okay. So as I said, in, in numerical models, we tend to represent these different quantities okay, in terms of different bulk categories in their in, in, in should we say in the modes. You remember we talked about that diagram of the different modes and we said that in general if we look into a cloud we find droplets in one of two categories. They're either on the kind of five to ten micron size which was the cloud droplets or we're in the raindrop uh, should we say category. And we discussed the reason for that was that the process were highly nonlinear. So if you don't reach the threshold you don't start to convert the cloud droplets into rain droplets, but once you reach that threshold, the process becomes efficient very quickly. So you very quickly convert cloud droplets into the raindrop size bin. So you don't have a continuous spectrum of drop sizes. So models take advantage of that, and what they tend to do is, as well as, remember that set of equations, the last one was for the, the water quantity, okay? And we said that that could be the water vapor, the mass of the water vapor, but there was actually a subscript I and that's because you can actually introduce several classes in a model of water categories if you want to keep them separately. So you could have one category that tells you in each box the mass of water vapor, but you might want to introduce a second equation that tells you in each box what the mass of cloud water is, or maybe cloud ice, or maybe rain, or maybe snow. So you might have as many or as few as you deem to be uh, appropriate. And so a very typical cloud parameterization scheme might introduce, for example, just two parameters. They might say, OK, let's have one prognostic equation that tells me, for example, how uh, the water vapor is changing with time. And we have a number of sources and sinks. And we have a second equation that tells me how the cloud liquid water is changing in time with a number of sources and sinks. And so, this is what these yellow boxes here represent. We have one for water vapor and one for cloud water ice. And so the numerical forecast model at the European Centre where I used to work, even though it's a state-of-the-art model, had this level of complexity of cloud scheme. It had two variables. The cloud water was divided into the either water or ice according to the local temperature. So if you're very cold, you assume that the cloud water is ice. If you're very warm, i.e. above zero, you assume it's liquid. And there's a range in between where you diagnostically divide it between the two. So you only have one uh, prognostic variable means you have a memory from one time step to the other. You know, Just like we had a prognostic variable for the uh, barotropic vorticity uh, in the, the equation for the vorticity. In this case here, in that particular model, for example, the rain and snow was not recorded from one time step to another. So when we have a process like a sink, the auto conversion, which I should talk about in a moment, that converts cloud liquid water into uh, raindrops, remember we had that table of the terminal velocities, and the raindrops were falling at, can you remember what speed they were falling at? It was quite fast. It was around 8 meters per second, wasn't it, if I remember rightly? I think the example for 1 millimeter. I, I, I should go back to the slide. But they're falling around 8 meters per second. Okay. So let's think about that for a moment. What was a typical time step for a climate model, I said? Can anybody remember what the time step for a climate model would be? Just on a kind of rough order. Was it in seconds or...? Yeah, on the order of an hour, let's say. We said 10 minutes to an hour. It depends on what parameter. Remember, what parameter determines how long a time step we can use, for example, in the models? Stability. Stability criteria depended on what. So if, why could we not just choose uh, a day? Remember, we had the very simple example of the exponential decay. Okay. So in the climate model, remember I said it depends on the grid box size. If you have large boxes, you can have longer time steps. So... As I said, you'll go into this in more detail if you carry on and do the full diploma next year because we have a course on the, uh, should we say, for example, the linear advection equation, numerical methods for solving these in more detail. So um, 
If you think about that for a moment, if we have an hour, so 3,600 seconds, how far does a raindrop fall in 3,600 seconds if it's traveling at, let's say, 10 meters per second? Quite a long way, yes? How deep is the uh, troposphere? Okay, so in one time step, I mean, raindrops are pretty much, we can assume they fall right out of the atmosphere. So a lot of models take the assumption that these quantities here are falling so fast that you don't really want to remember where they are. You can assume that once we have raindrops, they fall out of the atmosphere. Maybe you want to represent how they evaporate during their descent, but you assume that within one time step of the model, they disappear. They fall out to the surface. Okay. So I'm going to introduce just some of these arrows, just as an example of a cloud model parameterization. Remember that these are processes occurring on the micro scale of the cloud. So they're again, just like the example yesterday of the turbulence, they're occurring on small spatial cloud, uh, scales inside the cloud. So when we have these prognostic equations, we want to know what the rate of change is of the cloud water, for example. And so what that means is, essentially, is we're setting up a network of processes that convert water from one phase to another. Okay. I haven't mentioned it here, but of course, if we're changing phase, for, for example, from vapor to ice or liquid water, we need to also account for the temperature change due to the latent heating, but we won't worry about that here. Okay. So, for example, if the parcel of air is rising, it's expanding and cooling, the saturation vapor pressure is dropping, so then maybe we have condensation and we form liquid water. Okay. So we need to understand what that rate is. Okay. So, in fact, if you go back to Monday's lecture, remember we talked about the process of droplet activation. So we had haze particles that were wetted. And now, do you remember I, I talked about that critical threshold in terms of supersaturation in order to basically activate the droplet. Remember the curler curve? And we reached the peak of the curler curve and then the droplet became activated. It was unstable and it would grow very rapidly by diffusion into cloud liquid water. Okay. Can you remember what that threshold was at which uh, just roughly, was it on the order of like 1% supersaturation, 10%, 100%? Exactly, it was very small, it was less than 1%. So in fact, what we do with uh, climate models is that because that threshold is very small, okay, and because the process was very rapid, remember the time scales, we had also uh, a calculation, I didn't derive it, with the, the other group, in fact, we derived it mathematically, but uh, we talked about the time scales required in order to grow a droplet of one to two micron size. And if you remember, it was measured in just a few seconds. Okay, now compare that to a time step of a climate model. The climate model is integrating the equations forward at 10 minutes or an hour and yet the droplets activate and grow in just a few seconds. So in fact, what we tend to do is we have a very simple diagnostic assumption for the conversion of vapor to liquid water. We just simply say that if over a time step we have a certain amount of supersaturation, say the relative humidity and the rate of change will be such that the relative humidity will reach 110%, this extra 10%, we can just convert that into liquid water and reduce the relative humidity back to 100%. Okay, very simply. Because we assume that the process is fast. So when we say a process is fast for a model, what we mean is it's occurring on a time scale that's short compared to the numerical step of the model in which we solve the equations. Okay. So it's just like when we talked about a continuous function and we said that we can only resolve a certain amount of the variability. Remember I, I talked about that? So if you have small boxes, you can represent more of the variability of a function. It's the same with the, in the time dimension. If you have a process that takes 10 minutes and you step forward your equations one second at a time, 
you can resolve how that process is changing. Okay. But you can't if you have a, a step of one hour. So you have to just make a, a diagnostic assumption. Okay. The autoconversion process, and I've put this here. Don't get scared by these like, three equations. But what I want to ex explain here is, if you remember yesterday, we talked about uh, Monday, sorry, the auto... That was Tuesday, actually, no? <laughs> okay, I'll get it right in a minute. On Tuesday, we talked about uh, the process of converting cloud droplets to rain droplets, yes? So what was the uh, critical, should we say, aspect about the cloud droplets? What was the trigger in order for the process to become efficient? What did we need to have in the cloud? Say again? So, John, you had your hand first. Uh... Yes, right. You need to have a certain critical radius. What was that? Can you remember what that radius size was? 20 microns. So we needed droplets presence of 20 microns in order for the full speed differential to be large enough to increase the number of collisions. Remember the analogy through the motorway, on the motorway. If we have cars traveling at very different speeds, you know, and they've all got their eyes shut, you have lots of collisions. The bigger the difference in the speed, the more collisions we will have. Just the same with the raindrops. And so what we can do is we can actually turn that critical radius, in fact, into a, a critical mass of the droplets inside a volume if we know how many droplets we have in that volume. Okay? And we know normally how many droplets we have. That's related to the... What's that related to? How many droplets do we have? It's related to the number of aerosols. Remember? The CCN. So if we know the number of droplets and we know what their critical radius should be or the mean radius of 10 microns, then we can convert very easily the critical radius into a critical mass of water inside a, a unit volume. So this is this represented here by this Q crypt. So if we have below that level of cloud water, we assume that the drops are small and therefore we don't form uh, rain droplets. If we're above, then the process becomes very efficient with the full speeds and we can convert liquid water cloud droplets into larger raindrop sizes. Okay. Exactly. So in the ice processes, uh, it becomes more tricky. Uh, the kind of, should we say, co uh, should we say the, the coalescence process to represent exactly for the reason. We showed that plot at the beginning. I didn't go into details, but we have all the different shapes and that, that affects the full speeds. So in a model, you need to make an assumption about the full speed of the ice crystals. And it might just be a mean one or you might want to try and represent some kind of variance. But you're right, it's another aspect that increases the uncertainty. Uh, it's the same thing with the, the liquid water cloud in some respects, because you're making assumptions about the distribution of the drop size, and it might actually be very skewed and not symmetrical in certain cases. But there are always going to be aspects of the subgrid scale, the small scales, that you can't represent in these models. And this is why you're always going to have to make diagnostic assumptions, for example, about the crystal shape, which affects its full speed. And this is why, no matter how small these boxes become in models, there are always going to be scales that you can't represent. Even if you have a one kilometer box size that represents the deep convection, you know, these thunderstorm motions, you still can't represent the scales on the order of the, the ice crystal sizes. So there are always going to be things happening on small scales for which you have to make diagnostic assumptions. Okay. So this is just to show you three typical uh, equations that are used in models that essentially uh, represent this autoconversion process. So we have, for example, Kessler, which is just says that if we're below this critical radius or mass, then this is zero. But if we're above this critical mass, then we have a linearly increasing function. So dqc by dt on this axis as a function of the cloud liquid water 
looks like this. Okay. And then you have this Sunqvist term, which has a linear relationship, but rather than having just a discontinuous critical threshold, introduces this exponential. So then you have the same kind of effect, but it's linear and smooth, like this. Okay. But the constant A could be the same in both. That gives you, at large uh, droplet masses, the rate. Instead, this is another relationship that was derived with a fine-scale model, which is actually just a, a polynomial of a different order. Okay. And these are just three examples I've picked out, which are commonly used. You find many of these. Just to show you how, even now, in 2012, okay, it's not certain how this coalescence process exactly works. You can try and model it on small scales, and you can have good models that match fine-scale models, but it's not exact. It's not just one equation that we know for certain. You see, here we have three equations that all differ slightly in the way that represent this process. OK, again, this is just representing how the higher m is, the more nonlinear or fast, uh, should we say, the increasing the, the process is becoming as a function of QC. So what it means is it's the efficiency of the droplet collision. And it's basically it will be related, for example, to your spectrum of drop sizes okay, around the mean. Because this kind of critical threshold, for example, is just saying we, we're assuming some kind of, should we say, equal distribution, a Gaussian distribution, but it may be non-Gaussian. So it's related to how the efficiency of the process increases with an increasing mass of liquid water, in other words, the maximum drop sizes. So you can imagine if you've got a very skewed distribution with some very large droplets, for the same mean liquid water, you might have a much more efficient uh, process. Okay. Well, it's impossible to say for certain. I mean, at the end of the day, uh, you can try and test them with, uh, uh, should we say, data taken from clouds. But it's, def it's definitely difficult to validate these for certain because you have certain isolated case studies or you can have idealized models. But then, you know, this one here was derived from a different idealized model. And so that differs from these equations, but these have also been tested. And you're coming back to a good point. A lot of these, remember we said a lot of these values like A here, or the K, we can give a value from observations, but different observational case studies will give you a different value. So you have a distribution of possible tunable parameters in your model. It's just like the K for turbulence yesterday. This A or this M, it's the same thing. You can give a value from observations, but you might go out to the same location the next day and measure a different value of M, you see. So you can never say for certain that one is better than the other, but you can test them over a long period of time and get a feeling which one in general, works, you know, more efficiently for the most cases. Or you might want to try and generalize them and couple with an even better representation of the process, you see. Well, this, in fact, uh, basically, it just, again, relates to M. It's just a continuous function. So... The higher M is, then the faster it will increase. And then you can tune it back down with the A. But they haven't actually introduced a, a set uh, critical value, this one here. It's just that uh, at very small values of QL, this will anyway give a, a very small auto-conversion rate with this polynomial form. These have to use a crit because they're just linear at large QL. Okay. So it, it just really depends. If you take a small enough QL, this will be smaller than uh, the... Well, not the, because that's zero, but you just get very small auto-conversions here. Well, this, this was just because they, you know, researchers came up with a new idealized model. Okay. I don't want to dwell on this too much. It's just really to just show you that uh, 
there are different forms. We can talk about that a little bit offline if you want after the, the lesson. I'm a little bit conscious of time. So um, the other thing I wanted to show, well, this is just to show that, you know, we can extend this system and have other prognostic equations, cloud water, cloud ice, rain, and snow. But I wanted to show you one other example, which is to do with cloud cover. So the other aspect is the actual amount of the box that's covered by cloud. So if you can imagine, this is a, a GCM grid box, and these are kind of convection storms taking a place within this box. You can see that they're much smaller in dimension. We talked about this yesterday than the size of the box. And so in the models, we want to address problems to do with the geometry. So this is just a schematic. Remember we talked about uh, this is in the horizontal direction. So these are grid boxes in the horizontal direction, maybe of the order of 100 kilometers across. And this is the, the vertical direction. So what we might want to discuss, for example, is how much of the, uh, the box is actually covered in the horizontal. We could also discuss, I mean, there are other geometrical, geometrical aspects we might want to consider. So in this box here, we might also want to consider how much of the box in the vertical is covered by cloud. Okay? The cloud might not be uniform. We might have thick parts and thin parts of the cloud where the liquid water is much higher, the, the, uh, the uh, mass mixing ratio, the amount of liquid water might be much higher here than here. Why is that going to be important? We talked about nonlinear processes, remember. So the reflectivity when you have solar radiation, in this case, will be different to a cloud that is uh, uniform. We talked about the Cahalian constant after the lesson yesterday when we were chatting at the board. So this particular problem, for example, how does one represent cloud cover? I'm going to give a, another simple example of a parameterization scheme. So coming back uh, to the, the lecture on, on Tuesday, if you remember, we assume that we always have enough aerosols in order that if we have any supersaturation, we immediately form cloud liquid water. Yes? And it happens on very fast time scales. So we can't have supersaturation. So what this means as a result is we can only have parts of the grid box covered by cloud if we have subgrid scale variability of humidity and or temperature. Okay. So this is an example. If we have this cartoon here represents one grid box and this is the humidity and then this are two possible situations for the saturation mixing ratio. If the humidity exceeds the saturation mixing ratio and they're constant everywhere in the box, then the box has to be cloudy everywhere, yes? Because everywhere locally, the water exceeds the saturation mixing ratio and so we form clouds. On the other hand, if the humidity is less than the saturation value, then everywhere the box has to be clear because we have no variability. So we have two situations. Either the box is completely cloudy or it's completely clear. Is that clear? It's coming back just like yesterday. We were told it always links to the subgrid scale variations. Instead, if we have variability on the subgrid scale, now we have a situation where we can have partial cloudiness because in this case here, we have variability in the humidity, variability in the saturation value. And in certain portions here, here I've shaded with red on my diagram, we see that here the water vapor exceeds the saturation value, so we form clouds, but only in sub-portions of the domain. So here we have fractional cloudiness. Okay. So you can see that if we know the nature of those fluctuations or the statistics of those fluctuations, we can represent how much of a grid box is covered by a cloud. So, just for simplicity, I'm going to just think about the variability and the humidity for the moment and just assume that the temperature is invariant everywhere. You have the same picture. Wherever the humidity exceeds the temperature, we have clouds. Okay. 
So let's go through this step by step. Let's imagine that we go outside today and we measure the relative humidity and it's quite dry. And we have a relative humidity of 60%. We could have a situation where over 100 kilometers we have variability in the humidity. So if I walked along uh, and I was measuring the humidity content of the atmosphere, it would be varying as I moved. But the mean level of the relative humidity is so dry that even the moistest parts of my grid box are still subsaturated. So everywhere we're cloud free. So I can draw a point on this graph. Okay, we can just do a sample. I've measured zero cloud cover with 60% relative humidity. Okay. Now we can cool off the box, okay, and we can, or add humidity. So I'm not going to change the variance, I'm just lifting up the humidity curve. Now we can see that we have some parts of the box that become saturated. So maybe with a mean relative humidity of 80%, we have a cloud cover that has a value of, say, 20%. Okay. Now, I lift it further. Sorry, the plot has jumped up. Now we have quite a substantial proportion that's covered with cloud. And finally, we reach a situation where the whole box is cloudy. Even the parts here are super saturated and we form cloud there. After we've formed cloud, what's the value of relative humidity? It's written there, 100%. Why? Because everywhere, all of the excess is quickly converted from the vapor phase into the liquid droplets, remember, on short time scales. So we remain afterwards with a situation where all of the excess is converted into liquid water very rapidly, and we're left with the water vapor exactly at the saturation value. So we have 100% relative humidity. So we can plot a point, 100% relative humidity, 100% cloud cover. Okay. So now we have a functional form here, which tells me how cloud cover has changed as a function of relative humidity. Okay. But that function there, could I use it everywhere on the planet at all times? Could I just take that and say, if I measure 80% relative humidity, I have 20% cloud cover. Would that be always correct? No. Why not? Why would it be wrong very often? Exactly. So the, the pattern of the variability will change from place to place. Okay. And again, that variability will depend on how much turbulence we have, how much convective activity, how much dissipation, all of the processes will act to either enhance or decrease those fluctuations of vapor. Okay. So if we use a function like this in the model, what are we saying? What we're saying is that on average, if I go to lots of locations, okay, and I measure the variability of the humidity, my mean variance of the fluctuations is this. Okay. And therefore, my function looks like this on the mean. I'm describing the mean statistics of these fluctuations. It's never going to be right, ever. Okay. It's just the mean situation. It should remind you of a parameterization we already discussed just one lecture ago. Yeah? Remember the K? The K was describing the level of turbulent activity. And we said... It's never going to be right. It's just the mean value of the turbulent activity. Okay. So a lot of models, and some models still now, use a mean function like this. How could you improve it? Well, you could start to make the function flexible. You could start to say, okay, the shape of the function will change according to what's going on in terms of the other processes. Okay. Well, maybe not the shape of the function, but... What about this critical relative humidity? Okay, here we started to have cloud at 60%. But if I decrease the fluctuations, will I have a higher critical relative humidity for cloud formation or a lower one? So the fluctuation magnitude is getting smaller. Does that increase 
or decrease my critical relative humidity for cloud formation. Very good. So we increase the critical relative humidity. And in fact, if we go to the extreme uh, situation, remember, if you don't understand these equations, remember we said about the, uh, or the, the concept, uh, and like for example with a simple slab model, it's always best to think of a special example which is easier to understand and see how that fits. So what's the extreme for this? If you say, well, does it increase or decrease? I'm not quite sure. The extreme example is when you get rid of all of the variability. And you go back to the, the cartoon I just showed with flat lines. And then we know we have all or nothing. The cloud cover is zero or one. Okay. So the function there is zero until we reach 100% relative humidity and then one. See, Special example. It's the extreme case. Okay. So in fact, what I, like I mentioned yesterday, in fact, uh, what I was trying to do with my work over the last, uh, say, five to ten years... Uh, especially at Max Planck, was actually re produce a parameterization that explicitly represented the nature of these fluctuations in terms of the probability density function of the water content. Okay. So I actually modeled, rather than the statistics of the fluctuations, I was trying to model the nature of these fluctuations themselves. Okay. Just an example of where one avenue of the field has gone. Okay. Other aspects that we have to think about are how the clouds overlap. So these are different vertical boxes. Okay. And so you might want to put, if you have many layers with cloud, they may line up one above the other, or they may be randomly overlapped. Okay. And again, why is this important? Because the processes are highly nonlinear. Okay. So think about precipitation or think about solar radiation. Here, the sunlight may be mostly already reflected back by the top two clouds. So these are not interacting much with the sunlight because not much is getting through, just the 30%. Instead here, we have a very high total cloud cover. Same with the rainfall. Remember this collection process. If we start to form rain droplets here on the left, okay. Now, imagine these rain drops uh, would be falling through the clouds below and collecting more clouds and they get bigger, yeah? And so we end up with quite a strong precipitation flux. Now imagine this situation. These raindrops, okay, will be falling through clear sky, subsaturated. So what will they be doing? They won't be growing. They'll be shrinking. They'll be evaporating. So will these and so will these. Maybe we hardly have any precipitation at all in this situation, Okay. So again, these are just examples of aspects we have to consider. This is another aspect of a, a parameterization. Okay. So we started with something very simple, and already we're getting to something that's a lot more involved. And again, we, any of these assumptions where we assume that they always line up or they're randomly overlapped, essentially we're describing a mean statistics of the clouds. If you go out and measure the clouds, they will never be exactly randomly overlapped in this way. Sometimes they'll be further apart, sometimes more overlapped. But you want a relationship that describes the mean statistics. Okay. And then maybe you can then try to refine it for certain situations. You say, okay, if I have deep convection, then maybe they're more likely to be lined up. Okay. If I have just different separate cloud systems, maybe they're not lined up. In fact, that's what this assumption is here. But I don't want to go into details. But that's a refinement in that way. So if you throw all these in together, you can see things get pretty complicated. But anyway, um, so there are always going to be aspects. OK, uh, I have a couple of slides on radiation, but I'm, I'm not going to dwell on these, actually. I might skip over these, because I want to talk a little bit about ensemble models. And so I'm going to leave this just in case um, somebody's interested. We can chat about that afterwards. It's just two slides. OK, so. I've got a couple of take-home messages, and then we can start the next slide. You have a question? Yeah. Okay. Still now, it's okay, the, the geometry of the grid is like, okay, still now I saw like a box, something cubic or rectangle or something. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, well, you can have, uh, there are these, uh, I think they're called isodecahedral grids. So essentially it's quite topical at the moment. They're, they actually divide the globe up uh, into basically like a patchwork, like on a footballer. So that's why it's topical, you see. So uh, you can imagine each time they kick one of the balls, it's like a little atmospheric model. But, uh, and so those kind of patchworks or grids have advantages and disadvantages. If you have a latitude-longitude grid, what happens when you have regular latitude-longitude grids is you have a singularity, really, at the North Pole, you see, at the, and the South Pole as well. With one of these patchwork grids, and John Fubon, who was at the University of Reading, now he's at Exeter. I'm not very good at drawing this, but... Uh, so if you can imagine, you've got one of... The football looks roughly like this. You understand what I mean. The thing about a football is, it doesn't matter how much you turn it, it always looks the same, yes? But the problem is that you have an overhead, because in this case, it's very easy to know who your neighbours are, yeah? It's like living in a very friendly block of flats. You know who your neighbours are, okay, and where they're going and where they are. Here, you've got it's a more complicated overhead. You need to try and keep tabs on where your neighbours are, and it changes. It's irregular. So the should we say that the mathematics of this implementation is a little bit more tricky. But it's been done. There are models that have this kind of grid. And you can even have adaptive grids. So you can have grids that basically use uh, finite elements. I'm not an expert on this at all. Where You actually have grids that are irregular in order to try and refine the grid where you have lots going on. So if you have lots of motion and turbulence in one location, you maybe want to have smaller grid boxes to try and represent that variability in a more accurate way. Okay, so you can have adaptive grids and a football grid and a regular grid. So my take-home messages from this part of the talk, which finishes the main bulk of the, the lectures, is that uh, basically resolution, be it spatial or temporal in time, defines the finest scale of motions that can be explicitly modelled or the finest time scale of the process that you can represent if you're talking about time resolution. Okay. Essentially, we can call this the truncation scale. So any process that's occurring on smaller spatial scales, and we've talked about turbulence, cloud cover, uh, cloud overlap, radiation interaction with cloud, they were just some examples. All of these processes, the conversion of liquid water to raindrops, let's, they have to be parameterized. So I'm hoping now, I know it's been a bit of a fast two lectures, but I'm hoping now this concept of taking these physical processes, truncating them onto a discrete grid to solve them, and then trying to represent the effect of the small-scale processes in terms of the grid-resolved variables. Okay. So again, I didn't emphasize that on the cloud cover, but what I was doing again is I was taking the variability fluctuations, which were not resolved, and I was turning that into a function of the relative humidity, which was a resolved variable. You see, it's the grid mean relative humidity. So I, I didn't emphasize that when I was talking about it. So these have to be parameterized, okay. These parameterizations essentially are small models that you're fitting inside your big equation set. And they're essentially functions that are written in terms of the grid scale variables, okay. They can be guided by observations. They can be guided by higher resolution models, theory, but they can never really be exact. And that's because you're not resolving the nature of those fluctuations. So even if you understand the physics of the problem exactly, you're never going to know the nature of these fluctuations in every single grid box, like the example we said of the clouds. So you're only ever going to describe the statistics of the situation. And because these small-scale models, they affect what's happening on the large scales, it means that your model can't be exact. And especially for, for example, clouds, they actually impact and affect, uh, they can feedback. It's another climate feedback. We talked about in the first week of the course some different climate feedbacks, like ice reflecting solar radiation and leading to cooling. Uh, we talked about uh, clouds, for example. In a future climate, maybe the cloud cover would increase, and that would change the albedo of the planet, but it would also change the infrared outgoing long-wave radiation. Okay. And so... Changes in the carbon dioxide uh, can actually be amplified or decreased by these feedbacks. 
And these feedbacks, such as clouds, which are really important for the radiative budget, we saw that, uh, essentially are dependent on these subgrid scale models, which are not exact. So that's where your uncertainty comes in. So when people say climate models you know, are not certain at all, remember that the basic equation set is exact. The way that we can solve those models, we can do it very accurately now, but the problem is the small scale processes. And those parameterizations are not exact. They're improving, but they're not exact. So we're modeling the statistics. Okay. And the take home message three was that we have this balancing act where we're sharing computer resources between model resolution, time step, complexity of the physics parameterizations, and the number of ensemble members, which I wanted to talk about next. I'm a little bit time tight, but we'll see how we get on. Okay, I've got a couple of references there. So how are we doing so far? I've got some slides now, because this is where I wanted to get with the course, but I had some slides on model uncertainty in weather forecasts and climate models with some examples. If you want, I can uh, see how far I get through them. I was hoping for an hour, but uh, should I try and show some of these? I think we'll, we'll see how we get on. So it's to give you a little bit of detail about uh, measurements. Okay and uncertainty in climate models. Okay. But it's mostly about climate. Okay. Because I want to talk about error in weather forecast and climate models. So we can have essentially two kinds of predictability. So we have an initial value problem. And so this will be something like a weather forecast. We take the initial value is the state of the atmosphere now, and then I integrate those equation sets forward in time, and I can try and give you a prediction of what the weather will be like tomorrow. Okay. The first weather forecasts were this barotropic vorticity equation, where we're simply advecting vorticity around, conserving of vorticity. It changes due to advection and uh, basically the polar gradient of the Earth's rotation, for example. So, the second predictability is more concerned with the boundary value problem, which you have in, for example, climate integrations, where the boundary value is changing over time. So that could be, the boundary value could be, uh, if you have an atmosphere-only model, it could be uh, changing the sea surface temperature, or it could be the external conditions, for example, such as the carbon dioxide. So if we have an increasing in carbon dioxide over time, how does the atmosphere respond? So in that case, we're not trying to predict uh, on the 5th of April 2020, will there be a thunderstorm over Trieste? But we're trying to say, given a doubling in CO2, what will be the change in the statistics of the weather? Okay. So some of these colors are a little bit strange because I converted from PowerPoint to OpenOffice, so bear with me. So I'm going to talk a little bit about NWP, numerical weather prediction, just because uh, uh, I've, I've worked in both spheres, and I, I think it's quite nice to know about data simulation. So I'm not going to go into the technicalities of data simulation, but I wanted to highlight that when we say about measuring the atmosphere, and we have all these satellites and so on, it sounds like an easy problem. I just wanted to highlight it. It's not an easy problem. I mentioned it already. We have balloons measuring temperature and uh, humidity, and so we have a point measurement as the balloon raises up through space, which is high resolution in the vertical, but just a one-dimensional line of measurements. We have stations that measure temperature and humidity at two meters, okay? I think some of you visited the station this week, yeah? Was it both groups or just your group? Just your group, okay. Um, then you have, like, uh, satellite measurements, which are very, remember we talked about polar orbiters and we talked about geostationary orbits. In fact, we've done a lot, no, in six lectures. My goodness me. Anyway, um, so we talked about the fact that geostationary, we have very high temporal resolution, remember? And then polar orbiters, we perhaps only sample infrequently, but we managed to sample all of the globe with the same instrument. Okay. So we have to try and take all of those different observations and put them together into a, a single system. 
to give us a snapshot of what the atmospheric state is at any one particular time. Okay. It's a huge engineering problem. So, uh, see, this is the problem for the conversion. I'm sorry, this is moved over. So we have like a, a measurement here. We have to decide every single measurement what its radius of influence is. If you imagine this is the grid of grid boxes of a climate model or a weather forecast model, we have to say this measurement, is it just representative of the temperature in a small area or a very large area? Okay, and if we have many of the measurements from satellite, we try and give them a small weighting and they have a small radius of influence. And we can try and combine these all together in different uh, situations. And so what we have every day is we have observations that make an analysis. And the systems, what they try and do is they try and merge in the observations into a forecast uh, system. So starting from today at 12 o'clock, you run a small 12-hour forecast and then you try and incorporate into that forecast all of the different observations. Okay. And the reason why you do that, rather than just, should we say, interpolating the measurements, is you want the forecast to be dynamically and thermodynamically self-consistent. You don't want to have one measurement giving you a really hot area of air here, and another measurement over here giving you a very cold area of air, and then you end up with an unstable situation in the analysis. As soon as you start the forecast from the analysis, bang, you'll get this massive explosion of a deep convective event in the wrong location because the atmosphere is not in balance. So you try and merge the observations into your forecast system. Okay. And it's a huge number. I mean, this is already out of date. This is a slide I made uh, two or three years ago. Every 12 uh, hours, between 4 and 8 million observations are assimilated in these systems. So it's a huge technical task. Uh, as I said, this part of the, the course here you, is, is just kind of for interest sake. You don't have to remember these numbers. You won't get tested on this. This is just in case this is a little bit of a, should we say, an interest only end of the course. Okay. So, but it's, it's a huge, if you imagine like every 12 hours, you imagine somebody in Ghana goes out of their office with the balloon, they're launching this balloon, okay, off it flies. That data has to be radiated back down to the ground station, okay, sometimes there's some processing to do, quality controlled. It then gets beamed up by satellite, beamed down to a transmission station in North Africa, beamed up again, transmitted to holding centers. Yes, sure, no runs. You might, it might be easy to go around that way, I don't know. You're sitting in the worst location. Or out, out the back is also uh, perhaps easy. I don't know. You can just go through that door if you like. Anyway, so um, you imagine it's beamed back then to the holding stations, like in Reading or in uh, the United States. And then it has to be incorporated into this very complex system with the forecast and to be ready in a few hours in order to make the weather forecast for the next 10 days. Because it's no good that the, you know, the measurement turns up five days later and then it takes you another five days to do the forecast. You know? And we say, oh, the weather for one week ago will be. <laughs> so, I mean, this is really, uh, this is why we need big computers for this. Anyway, so I'm not going to dwell on this too long, but just to give you some examples. So this is uh, the network of the Stevenson screens. You can see one up in Col, just nearby, and, and some of you saw one this week. So you can see the density of the observations, how it changes. There are some areas that are very highly dense, densely uh, observed here in West Africa, Europe, uh, uh, China, so on. And you have some areas where uh, there are less dense observations. This is not to say that these observations are not there. Okay? Ethiopia, for example, has a lot of uh, stations. They have like 150 operational rain gauges. It's just that those stations are not necessarily linked up to this system that collects the station data in order to initialize the forecasts. So the, the data remains within the country concerned. So not all countries, Ethiopia only transmits a few of those stations, for example, whereas some countries transmit all of the, the, the data that they, they collect. Okay. Uh, well, I'm on film, so I don't want to get too much into politics, but uh, 
It depends how you want to, you know, some, some station, uh, should we say services, they like to try and sell the data offline to companies and so on, so they don't want too much of the data to go out. Uh, some countries, they prefer to give more data out because that leads to an improvement of the forecasts that they then get back and they use locally. So it just depends how you want to use the data. Um, and, it, you know, each service makes their own kind of economic and political decisions. Uh, yes. And, and, okay, so the number is to be at the easy possible to process in, in a computer? I mean, 8 million something? Like that? yeah, that's done already in the system. 8 million are actually incorporated into the ESMWF uh, system. Some of the, like the satellite data, you will filter it. So you'll only use maybe every fourth point if it's too dense. So you do do some, you know, kind of filtering of the data. So these are the balloons. Uh, that's, that's, that's me actually launching one of these in Ghana a couple of years ago uh, with my terrible hat, which I lost shortly afterwards, actually. So that's my ex-hat. Um, anyway, you can see that these things, for example, this is an RS-92, Vasila Radiosont. Uh, so this little packet here is measuring humidity and temperature. It has a little radio antenna. It's not very clear. To, I don't know if you can see it more clearly if we just turn this off here. So it's got a little antenna, you probably can't see it on the top, that radios the information back down uh, to the ground stations. And then it's tied to a line to this balloon, and these balloons can get up to around you know, 20, 25 kilometers, sometimes even 30, before they're expanding, of course, as they go up, and eventually poof, they'll just pop when the pressure gets too low outside. And, uh, and off it goes. So it's actually quite a, a you know, high-tech little instrument uh, the, the humidity sensor, for example, is actually a dual sensor. They have two sensors inside, and they actually switch from one while they heat the other, so they rapidly switch between them. So why do you think they do that? Why would they want to heat one sensor while they measure from the other and then switch back? Icing, exactly, because when you're going through, if it goes through a cloud, you can get uh, like water or ice on the instrument, and then as it gets colder, that, that water, if it's liquid water, can freeze if you have condensation. So you want to de-ice it, otherwise you make false measurements. You know, the measurements is of uh, saturation, when in fact you've gone back out through the cloud into subsaturated air. But you still have this ice on the measurement instrument. So you can see these things at about, uh, I think they're around 700 euros a pop, or maybe $700, I don't remember if it's dollars or euro. And you never get it back, okay? So it's, it's not just... Uh, and then you have also got to pay for the observer to launch it. Uh, you have the ground station, which is not cheap, you know? And so you can see that these are much less frequent. I mean, look at the UK. We have one, two, maybe three of these stations reporting, you know? Possibly four. Same with Italy. You can see that the density is much lower, Okay. Uh, aircraft data goes into this forecasting system. So these are uh, typical tracks of aircraft that have basically high quality measurements of temperature and uh, humidity. And so you get information, but of course only along the commercial flight tracks. So we have a lot of information in the upper troposphere and lower stratosphere over the Atlantic because of all the traffic between Europe and the United States. But you can see that other areas have fewer of these equipped flights just because the air traffic density is lower, of course. Okay. And this is just to show how this explosion in satellite data is so recent. I mean, we're not going back to the uh, 18th century here. Look at this. I have to update this slide as well, I'm afraid. I made these slides in 2009, so I only had information up to 2008. But look how the number of satellite data has gone up just in the last 10 years. It's amazing the total data that's gone into these systems. So it's really a revolution. People that, you know, with weather forecast models have improved massively due to this data that's now used in a much more clever way over the last uh, 10 years. And this is just to show some typical satellite tracks. So this comes back, remember, to the polar and the geostationary orbiting. So what kind of a satellite is this? Geostationary or polar? Polar. 
geostationary because we have this footprint which is not moving. And here we have the polar instruments. So just to show you. Okay. The 8 million observations a day need a big computer. So just to show, again, just out of interest sake, just to show you how between 78 and 2008, CPU power went up by a factor of 5,000 to make these forecasts, just as an example. Disk space and so on. So the peak performance, in fact, went up by a factor of 250,000. And it's gone up by another, I think, a factor of two or three since I left uh, in uh, 2008. I came here, 2007. And all of these uh, observations are really improved uh, the, the forecasts, but as well as improvements to the model physics, the cloud representation, and so on. But what you notice with those satellite observations is these lines, so just concentrate, for example, on this. This is the quality of the forecast at day five. So if I make a prediction for five days ahead, how good is it? And this is a scale here. So 100 is excellent. It's a perfect forecast. So you can see that the solid line is for the northern hemisphere, and the thin line is for the southern hemisphere. And so what you see is over the southern hemisphere, there was usually a, a big drop in skill of the forecast compared to the northern hemisphere because you don't have much land mass. And so the observation density was much, much lower. Okay. And so you can see here that the uh, last few years, the last decade, because we have all the satellite information, so the sampling now is fairly close, that we actually have the observations approaching each other. This is not to say that you can't use the conventional observations because essentially every time you launch a satellite it has to be calibrated and it's calibrated by the use of conventional observations. Okay. And so satellite data, for example, doesn't give you any vertical structure. You don't have any information of the near surface uh, and you don't have any absolute information so you need to have satellites that overlap. In other words, when you launch a new one, you still need the old one to be there in order to be able to calibrate the measurements. And you also need to have, for example, these radio sons are really important because it's the only absolute uh, information that you have of the upper atmosphere. Okay. And you use that to calibrate the information that you get from the satellite because once it's launched, you have no way to know if the brightness temperature is 4 degrees too low or too high. Okay. Okay, I think I'm going to skip over that actually due to the time. I have a couple of slides on the ocean just to show you because I've talked about the atmosphere. I haven't talked at all in the course about the ocean, so I wanted to show you just a couple of slides also of how the ocean observation system has changed. So this starts here from the 1800s, 1860, and it's just showing the technology changes. So we have 1900 right up to 2000. And we have uh, wooden buckets, then canvas buckets, uh, rubber buckets, and now we have buoys. And I don't remember, actually, I think this is engine inlet, uh, basically, measurements. If I say it should be on here. Yeah, engine inlet and hull contact sensors. So this is where they measured the uh, water that sucked into the engines to cool them. Okay. And so you can see that one of the problems here, for example, if you want to measure the impact of climate change, is uh, that your technology of the measurements changes over time. Yes? And so you have to try and compare them in a way that's uh, comparable. You have to try and use places where you have both kinds of technology and try and work out how that changes your measurements. So this is just like one kind of these uh, methods to measure. One of these, uh, uh, these things are shot as a, how do you call it, a Buffy thermograph. I never pronounced that correctly. So it's just very low technology. It measures, I think, temperature and salinity. Uh, this thing is actually joined to that thing on a wire. Okay, so it's not like an independent uh, object. You fire it in, it just basically sinks down, taking a profile. And the information is just comes up the wire. Okay. Now, this was the big, uh, should we say, revolution, these Argo flows. 
Now, these things, are, are, I think they're amazing. So they're, they're independent, okay? So they're just floating around. There's loads of them all just floating around, okay? They can, on command, they can sink under the surface. So they can sink under the surface, measuring salinity and temperature through a profile. And they keep, you know, just bobbing around and moving around, measuring these profiles. And every now and again, they're just like a submarine, and they pop back up to the surface and then radio the information back. And then off they go back again. And every now and again, you have to bring them up to the ship for some maintenance. And these things have massively increased in their network. So this is how many of them there are now. It's, uh, I find this incredible, and it's still increasing. So this is, uh, I took this slide last year for uh, 2010, the actual measurement was taken. So these things are all over the place. How much is your lifetime? Can you call me the Say again? I don't know actually how long they last. It's measured in years, I know. And they're going to the second generation now. Four, four years, yeah? I thought it was on the order of like four or five years, but I wasn't sure. So you've talked about this then? Okay, so he's the guy to talk to afterwards. Well, I'm, I'm hoping people pick up the balloons and uh, res recycle them responsibly if they find them. Uh, anyway, you see there are not many of these balloons. Uh, I don't know if it's biodegradable, the rubber uh, that they use. Well, in the UK, we have uh, basically about five per day. So that, yeah, so that's 1,500 a year. Well, they just land where they land, yeah. But then you have to measure that against the benefit of the weather forecasts. <laughs> so this is the uh, increase in these uh, float data. So I'm going to skip over this quickly. So I have some lectures on errors in models as well. Uh, well I'm going to really tight on time. I'm going to try and do some of these slides, and then uh, I may have to try and, I don't know, if there's any interest, I could always just do a kind of around the blackboard presentation uh, next week for anyone who's interested. Okay, so errors in models. And I, I, some of this I want to show you. Essentially, these weather forecast models can go wrong, and so we need to represent this error. So this is just one example where uh, the analysis here was for a large storm, and it was massively underpredicted by the model. Okay. So these models can fail because either the initial conditions are not accurate enough, okay, so not enough of the balloons or not enough of the satellite data, it's not been uh, put together in the right way, uh, or there's model error. So maybe the initial condition is perfect, but my cloud parameterization that I put in has errors, yeah, because it's only representing the mean statistics of the clouds, and that feeds back and it leads to a different evolution. Usually, it's a combination of the two, initial conditions and model error. Okay. So we can imagine we start from a certain initial condition. The forecast is going forward in time, and we have this new state here. We can have an error in initial conditions that leads to a very different situation here. Because remember that the atmosphere is a chaotic system, so very small initial changes can very quickly amplify and lead to a different state. So that's kind of known as the, the butterfly effect. Or we can have an imperfect model where the physics in the model is incorrect that we've talked about, the parameterization. So we lead to having an error in the model. Okay. And so as I said, it depends on the initial condition itself. So the butterfly effect makes it sound like all butterflies are extremely dangerous. Yeah? But before you go and wipe them all out uh, to save us having all these hurricanes, uh, Remember that in most cases, if you have perturbations, they will just dissipate. The atmosphere will be sensitive in certain situations. So this is just an illustration from the Lorentz system where this is just a nonlinear system. And you can see that this initial condition of points in time stays coherent 
but in this case we have a chaotic situation starting from here where we very quickly go to a situation where after a short period of time we can arrive here, here, here or here because we're in a chaotic regime where the system diverges very quickly. Okay. So we can see that, for example, these are all different forecasts starting from different initial conditions and after six days, you know, it's hard to see much similarity between the different forecasts, you know. So how do we actually address this problem? How can we actually take into account uh, the error due to, for example, initial conditions? What do you think we can do? We already had a clue with the last slide. If we have a forecast, and it may be right or it may be wrong, and we want to have an idea of how to assess the level of un uncertainty. What can we do, do you think? Mm. We could run more than one forecast, no? So having different initial conditions. So remember this. If we look... Oops. So what we could actually do, if we go back, okay, previous, sorry. If we look at this, if we actually started from initial conditions, if all of these forecasts look similar, then we know that the atmosphere is in a situation that's very predictable. Okay. If the forecasts are very different, then we know that the situation is not very predictable. So we can start with a perturbation to the initial conditions and then we can run with lots of different perturbations to the forecast physics and we end up with a cluster of potential forecasts. Yeah? So we have all these different forecasts and this is the uh, actual solution. And so we can measure the variability between these forecasts if it's for like temperature and this is the, the basically called the ensemble spread. Okay. So what we want is the variability between the forecasts to be roughly the same as the error in the, in the model. Well, you can have different models and also different initial conditions. Okay. So it could be either different models or it could be the same model with those K values perturbed for the parameterizations. Okay. And so what you want is essentially from starting, say, from 12 o'clock today, we run 50 forecasts and we see how they diverge over time. And we compare after one day the forecast to what actually happened. And we want basically that the spread in the forecasts to be roughly the same as the spread in the RS, RMS error, so the, the error between the, uh, the mean of the ensemble and the observed state. Okay. So if the, the, the models cluster too closely and the error is actually much bigger, this means that your model system is overconfident. You don't have enough variance between the models. Okay. I'm going to skip over this. So this is just to show you how this uh, runs. This is a, a forecast for the situation one day ahead and we have 50 of these forecasts. And I've just blown up these two. It's a little bit low resolution. And you can see that after one day, the forecasts are very similar, but after basically six days, you have completely different situations for these two forecasts. And so you can combine all of these forecasts together and work out probability maps. So this is why when you look at forecasts, you often get a probability. So maybe the, the, the probability, it will say tomorrow, uh, over Trieste, it might rain with a probability of 70%. So you, have you ever asked yourself where this 70% comes from? How can we calculate it? Well, if we run 10 forecasts and seven of them have rainfall and three of them not, then we know we have a probability of 70%. If 10 of them give rain, then we say we think we have a 100% probability of rain out of the 10. Okay. Now, okay, question. If I say tomorrow there's a 50% chance of rain, if it rains, was I right or was I wrong? <laughs>
how do you validate uh, an ensemble forecast? I'm right. What happens if, if I say there's an 80% chance of rain? Okay, I say 80% chance of rain tomorrow and it doesn't rain. Was I right or was I wrong? You are saying 20% not rain, so. Yeah. And it doesn't rain. Is that a good forecast? If I say to you, tomorrow is 80% chance of rain, would you take your umbrella? Yes. Okay, and it doesn't rain, would you then be cursing and, uh, at me saying that Tompkins, honestly, has no idea. <laughs> <laughs> he told me, 80% chance of rain, and look at it, it's beautiful blue skies. I mean, you'd probably be a bit upset. So how would you test my forecast? Uh, well, just, let's, let's see if we have an answer to the question first. Hang on. So how would you test my forecast? Excellent, exactly. No, yes, good. It's, uh, no, I don't always get an answer to the question. So, if I, over a year, I give you forecasts, you can look at all of the times I predicted rainfall with a 80% probability. And if in 80% of those times it rained and 20% of the times it didn't rain, that means my forecast system is very good, yes? But if it never rains <laughs> all those times, then you know it's very bad. So it's a probabilistic forecast, and you need to uh, validate it in a probabilistic sense. Okay. So maps such as this need to be tested and validated over time. Oh, yeah, sorry. Would, would that be also to another time? Because if, if you predict eight days, eight, each event that you predict data percent comes, comes true, then anything less than seven, five is wrong, then you may need your two. So if you should do something, well, I mean, what you're highlighting is one of the problems when you make a, a forecast with a percentage, and it's the same with climate models. I'm not going to get much of a chance to talk about ensembles with climate models, but it's the same kind of principle, yeah, because people are used to having a, a single deterministic forecast. They want to know, do I go to the beach or do I stay at home? Do I take my umbrella? Uh, do I need my sun cream? Okay. And so that makes it difficult when you have this kind of forecast to represent the uncertainty. Even professional forecasters don't use the ensemble information very much. Okay. They really don't. Uh, so it's, it's communicating that aspect of the forecast is still very difficult, and we don't do it very well. If you look at the Osmere forecasts, they always have... 60-70% probability. So I don't know where they derive that from. Because it's always, always, always 60 or 70% on their forecast for the region here. So if you have a chance, next time you talk to a Fulvio or something on their visit, you should ask them. So this is another example, a hurricane track. You can see in this case, we have a lot of variability in the tracks. And in this case, a very small variability. So again, it's just another example of looking at the uncertainty level of how the solutions diverge. Okay. I'm going to skip over this, because I want to talk about climate uh, a little bit. Okay. So when we talk about uh, uh, climate models and ensembles, then it gets a little bit more uh, tricky, because then uh, the atmosphere becomes unimportant, and it's actually uh, the ocean perturbations and also the model error that's much more important. So I don't know, let's have a look. So then we have to worry much more, not about the initial conditions, but the model physics. So for climate models that are integrated for long times or seasonal forecast models for six months or so, we need to worry about how we actually perturb the, the model physics. And there are like four ways in which this is done. So in stochastic physics, we take the, the physics scheme, like for the clouds, and we take the output, and maybe we perturb the output of that scheme. Or we can actually change the parameterizations. So this comes back to this K. Remember this K? So we could run the model 50 times, and each time we take a different value of K. Because remember, we don't know what the K is in the turbulence or the A is in the autoconversion. So maybe instead of having just the mean value that we think is right, we might take a perturbed value, okay? 
we could actually take a whole different parameterization choice. Remember, we had three equations for the autoconversion. Maybe we're on one model with one parameterization, one with another. Or we could actually have a multimodal approach. So the multimodal is what's used for climate problems, where climate models are very expensive. So rather than running one climate model in lots of different configurations, you rely on different centers around the world, each to contribute their own climate model. And each has its own representation of the physics. Okay. So these are the two most commonly uh, move, used um, methodologies. So the take-home message to this part here is that in short-range NWP, it's the initial state that's really important okay, for the predictability. And efforts have really focused in research on the data assimilation systems and how to incorporate new observations. Okay. But once you go above 5 to 10 uh, days in terms of your forecast length, then the model physics gets much more important and the way you perturb the model physics becomes much more important to assess uncertainty. Okay. So I think I probably might stop there at that point because what I have actually here, what I might do is I might uh, organize a small offline uh, lecture just out of interest sake uh, next week just in case anyone's interested. I can show the kind of thing I wanted to talk about on the climate models. Uh, which was just basically on emissions and, uh, should we say, model uncertainty. Uh, and so the main message I wanted to show you there, this was the CO2 emissions into the future, was the fact uh, that the models have uh, basically, we have this multi-model system, and I wanted to talk about uh, the variability. But we can talk about this next week, uh, should we say, at the blackboard if you want to. But the one slide I'll just show very quickly there is that now, rather than making a 10-day or a six-month forecast, if you have a climate model integration, so this is in years now, okay? And so we're going out to 100 years, and we're running many climate models to try and sample the different uh, possible outcomes of the climate. Then your impacts on the ensemble, remember that, remember that picture, it's exactly the same picture, you're starting from different initial conditions, you have different trajectories forward in time, and then you have a, a cluster of forecasts. It's just that instead of these being forecasts of the temperature after two days, these are forecasts of the mean climate of temperature after 50 years, okay? But it's the same principle, and this might be the climate model of the UK Met Office, this might be the climate model of Max Planck, and this might be the, the climate model of uh, ECR for the Dutch group. So you have each of these models contributing to the IPCC process, models from the United States, there's the Australian model, the Canadian model, uh, the Japanese model, and so on. And so you can then look at the variance and try and identify where the level of uncertainty comes from. So this is a nice paper by Hawkins and Sutton. And it's dividing up the uncertainty between three components. One is the internal variability. So this is really like almost the initial condition uncertainty, starting from different states, not knowing what the initial state of the ocean is. Okay. The second in green is the scenario uncertainty. So by scenario uncertainty, this means the future possible evolution of the carbon dioxide that we're emitting into the atmosphere, and the methane emissions, and so on, and the aerosol emissions. Okay. And the blue is the uncertainty due to the model configuration. And that means the physics of the model, how we represent the clouds, the turbulence, all of these parameterizations, the advection scheme for the numerics. Okay. So on a global scale, if we look at very short ranges into the future, we see at the very short range of the time scale of just a few years or sub-year, the green scenario uncertainty is very small. And we expect this to be small because we have a fairly reasonable idea of what the CO2 output will be in the next two or three years. We can say, well, we expect the economy to start to recover. Uh, there'll be this much population growth in China. Uh, this many more power stations needed there, uh, 
uh, we can have a reasonable idea of how the carbon dioxide will change. That said, just going back a couple of slides, if you don't mind, one slide I quickly went over was this one here. This is actually fossil fuel emissions, okay, observed. These are the predictions that were made uh, starting, I think, from the 2000 point, okay? And so this was like the worst case. If we really don't make any legislation change, we're carrying on as we are now, burning everything that we can dig out of the ground. Everybody uses their cars as much as possible. And these are other predictions made in the year 2000, saying, okay, then we start to get more responsible. Everybody, everybody buys energy-saving light bulbs. We all go to smaller cars, start using our bicycle. Uh, these were the next two years okay, of emissions calculated. So even five years ahead, you can see that uh, this is a little bit scary. Yeah, this, In 2007 and 2008, it actually dropped back down inside of these lines okay, because of the economic crash. So you need one of the worst recessions that we've had, I think, since the 1930s. I mean, it's the worst global recession for essentially 80 years. And it needs that recession to bring us back down inside of the worst possible emission scenario case. I find that a little bit uh, scary, actually. If the climate model predictions are true, that means we really are, have a little bit of cause for concern. But nevertheless, on these short time scales, the green tells us that the uncertainty due to the carbon dioxide is actually a very small component. The initial conditions, remember, if this were a two-day forecast, this would be all orange, because it's all down to the initial condition error over the two days. The model is hardly important at all. On the one-year time scale already, the model physics is very important. So if you want to go and do a PhD working on the representation of clouds, for example, or ice in models, or whatever it is, a component of climate models, you can see it's really needed because the uncertainty in the models out to 20, 30 years is the dominant component. As we go forward in time, of course, and these uh, situations diverge, the internal variability, so for example, is do we have uh, ENSO or La Nina conditions? You know, uh, which phase of the uh, like situation are we going to have a colder or use, warmer winter than usual? You can imagine that the variability from year to year in our winters becomes smaller because we drift into a warmer and warmer climate. So that variability compared to the climate change signal, for example, gets less important. And the uncertainty due to the uh, emissions in the economy, we really don't know what's going on here. So this becomes much larger. And the uncertainty due to the models becomes a smaller component. Okay. So you can see that by... 100 years' time, so 2090, 2100, that the majority of the uncertainty is in the economics of the scenario and the emissions. And the minority is in the model physics itself. Okay? And the actual internal variability is a tiny component. Okay. Now, this is quite an interesting result because what it means is that when people say, oh, you know, global warming... You know, we, we don't need to worry about it because the models are completely wrong. There are uncertainties in models. However, this is telling us that the far biggest uncertainty is knowing what's going to actually happen with the economic scenarios as it stands. Okay. Assuming that our small collection of global models represent a sample, the uncertainty space of the physics. Because if you imagine that, if I make a cloud scheme and then uh, they decide in Hamburg it's quite a good idea and they put it into the Hamburg model and then in the British Isles they decide it's a nice cloud scheme and they put it into their model, you can end up with the same physics in lots of different models. And so maybe those models are more similar than we think and they're not sampling the uncertainty. Again, remember, this forecasts could be a cluster like this, but if the actual outcome is over here, it means that our sample of uncertainty for the physics is not sampling a wide enough space, that we're overconfident, that the models are all very similar, but what actually happens is over here. 
But of course, for a weather forecast, we can measure this and tune the perturbations because we only have to wait two days and we know what the weather is. Okay. To work out if we're overconfident here, we have to wait 100 years. Okay.